a little announcement first, and that is that uh, uh, following a CIRCOM board meeting this morning, uh, we are pleased to announce that um, we have now an interim general secretary for the next six months, and it is Maria Nemchik. And just to welcome Maria as our interim general secretary. And we are all quite thrilled with that news. Thank you again. OK. As I said earlier, there is always that moment. You know when you're so optimistic about something? And we all have one of those guys or gals who works with us. You know the day when you go into work and you have the great idea? That which is going to change everything. But there's that guy or that gal who says, ah, ah, can't do that because. What we have this morning is a touch of that theme, but with a difference. Because it's probably the guy who will tell you, you can't do that. And here is some really goddamn serious stuff to convince you on a factually researched basis why you can't. Yes, we're at the crossroads. Yes, it's challenging. Seven years ago, when my organization had a lot more money and a lot less sense, I was sent on a management training course to the Banff Institute in Canada. And that's where I met Doug McNamara. He takes no responsibility for my lack of development ever since. But in this game, we meet on a daily basis the people with the great insights. And we normally dismiss them afterwards over a cup of coffee and if the conversation about their brilliance goes beyond seven seconds, it is a wonder of the world. Doug McNamara is different because seven years later, he still gets in there someplace and I hear him asking me questions. I want to welcome Doug McNamara and the rest will speak for itself and so will Doug. Kid Folter. Okay, thank you. Actually, I think probably what I'll, I'll uh, help you with is telling you what you can do, actually, rather than what you can't. Um, but uh, as, as we start, um, let me uh, ask you to do a couple things. Um, those of you who have these mobile devices, uh, please take them out. And I'm encouraging you to turn them on uh, in silent mode, maybe, or vibrate mode. But we are going to uh, use Twitter in this session. Uh, for those of you who have Twitter, if you've played with it before or not, I would encourage you to do this. And my colleague uh, around the corner here, Paul Powles from, uh, from Strasbourg, he's going to be capturing on, on our Twitter board here uh, and use the hashtag, uh, hashtag CIRCOM 2010 key. And if you basically, uh, you type that in to the front edge of your comment, and then give it a space, and then type in, you know, any kind of thoughtful questions or uh, insightful ideas. And what we're going to do is that the towards the end of the session, we're going to turn this. We're going to find out what you guys are thinking and some of the brilliant ideas and thoughtful questions that have come up during the session. We'll also take them directly from the audience as well for the non-techno. Uh, people, but um, you know, one of the, one of the interesting things I find is that um, with all the executives I deal with in the media world, how few of them actually 
use the stuff, the new stuff? Uh, how many have actually played on Facebook or played on Twitter, played on LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, and that sort of thing? So let's just actually try to use some of this uh, technology that's uh, part of our game now uh, during this session. Okay, so Paul, I think we can probably turn the screen off now. I don't want that to be a distraction during the session, but we'll turn back to it towards the end. So just because you can't see your tweets coming up there doesn't mean that they aren't being collected. So again, if there's something through the session that stimulates a great idea or a great, great question, just tweet it and we'll collect it. If you don't have a tweet mechanism, write it down and use the old fashioned way. That's ex perfectly acceptable too. Um, okay, well, uh, some months ago I wrote an article which actually uh, Michael said he read, which is good called Reset uh, and the, the challenging times and the need to reset our, our whole thinking and our whole organization. If there is a theme, I think, uh, based on the earlier comments that we had uh, today, um, one, of the, one of the clear uh, challenges, I think, is when you're surrounded by so much uh, change and so many challenges and so on, to have the courage to push the reset button in your organization and not to reset it back to where it was in 1940 something when it was created, but to reset it and then update it to the current times or to the future times. And really that's our challenge going forward. Now we gotta get this technology to work. Um, I mean, we, we've, we've heard all the challenges and I'm not gonna go through uh, all of them again that you heard this morning. Um, I agree with some of them and I possibly would challenge some of the other ones, but uh, clearly, we have to uh, develop uh, programming and content, everything from the large plasma screens to now what's becoming a, a very portable Dick Tracy-like uh, uh, portable device and um, making, making it relevant uh, to the audiences along the way. Um, some of the challenges that we, that we heard this morning, more channel offerings, in Canada, we have over 150 channels, um, and uh, so that forces you to be pretty, uh, you, pretty good at telling your story and making sure you know who, uh, who you focus on. Um, certainly, we have more, more of the distribution channels themselves, web, mobile, and so on. Commuter is becoming, and public even, uh, is becoming uh, up there. Um, and of course, you're, you're competing against the health juggernaut for funding. In, uh, in your governments. But um, I, I saw this in, in the, on the website leading up to the session where it said, meanwhile, the private sector can better find money to invest in the future and more easily attract talent and ideas. And I'm not sure I actually believe that. And of course, uh, some of our uh, private sector folks were, were uh, sharing with us the challenge. I mean, in Canada right now, um, the private broadcasters have seen a decrease in about 30% of their advertising revenue. And you say, well, 30%, that still gives them 70, but 30% is all the profit margin, right? There was a big uh, report that came out la just last week from the United States, ABC, NBC, and so on. Again, a 20 to 30% decline in advertising revenue, which is essentially all their profits. So the, pro the, the private broadcaster side is, is not having a better go at this than you guys are. Um, and uh, so I think we can just maybe punt that idea. We're all, in, we're all uh, f faced by challenges. Um, so uh, wouldn't it be nice if at the end of this session you could come out and feel quite re revitalized uh, with what uh, uh, your role could be, um, maybe re-inspired and also with a formula or some formula for some new success. And I think that that is what I hope to achieve for you today is uh, to give you some ideas uh, and some understanding behind some of the shifts and changes around us so that you can go back uh, and uh, bring these attributes. But I, I will say this, um, and I, I, I thank you for your final comments there in the last session. Um, you guys were being very polite to each other this morning, and I think it is time, and I would like to challenge you throughout the rest of this conference to engage in what I would call straight talk. Let's just put it on the table, tell it like it is, respectfully so. I'm not here to annoy anybody or upset anybody, but I am here to try to get us talking in straight 
uh, straight ways. And, and think forward. Let's not think about the past. Let's think about forward and how we're moving, how we're going to move forward. This uh, technology is really challenging here. Okay. All right, there we go. Um, okay, so uh, listen, on the left is uh, what we've tended to think is the reason for having public broadcasting, and on the right is, is generally what we believe commercial broadcasting and television to, to, to be about, right? Um, and I would just reinforce a, a few things that are, that are particularly important. Commercial television doesn't, um, doesn't uh, really try to do everything for everybody. Um, and it really is entertainment. Now, I, I heard somebody use entertainment with respect to public broadcasting this morning, and I'm actually not sure, I'm not convinced that's true. I don't think we're in the entertainment business. I think we are uh, doing uh, programming for the common good. And uh, we do hear about the, the, the values of uh, truthful and moral and excellence and so on. Um, but anyway, uh, I think, you know, generally speaking, this is the, the items on the left is, is how public television was, was uh, structured in the first place. Now our challenge is to figure out what does that mean for 2020 and beyond and rethink how do we deliver on this for the next 10 to 20 years, recognizing that the commercial television guys are going to keep doing what's on the right, and that's okay. But are we really good at doing the left? Now, in fact, um, I would suggest to you public broadcasting, especially the large um, national public broadcasters, is really providing what the population needs. And um, that's different than the commercial um, channels, which are there to uh, produce what the consumers want, if they actually know what they want. Um, and I would say the community media, and I'm going to spend probably more of my emphasis today uh, talking about the community uh, channels, community media. I think that we don't, we don't talk so much about this uh, in this industry. Um, I think the job of community media is to provide that sense of belonging and sense of achievement in our communities. Now, uh, you, you were talking earlier about the relevancy of, of the community broadcaster. Are you doing that? Do you deliver a sense of achievement and a sense of belonging from the, the programming that you provide to your community. I think that's a real opportunity um, for the future. Come on, come on. Technology, work. Guys, come on, I, I, what's going on? I'm sorry, back, please, back, back, there we go. Now, I'm gonna focus on three things today. First is, um, do you know and are you programming to build on the dreams of your community? We talked a lot this morning about all kinds of things, regulation and funding and so on. But ultimately, regional television is about tapping into the dreams of the community, putting them up there, facilitating them, enhancing them, and so on. Back. Back one. Okay. Thank you. It's not about funding. Seriously, it's not about funding. When I first came to Banff and I, you know, we're a public, uh, uh, public uh, entity there, um, the first week I got there, two-thirds of my staff unionized. The third week I was there, the government cut our funding 70% uh, and to, to start a week later. Um, 
Of course, we were concerned about funding, but it isn't about funding. It's whether or not our programming is tapped in to the needs of the people that we're serving. And so really, my first point, and I'll expand upon this in a moment, is about how do we better inspire and enlighten and engage the people in our community um, uh, about their aspirations and their dreams. Next, thank you, okay. Second of all, your people. Do your people ooze passion for community stories? I mean, seriously, think about the people in your organization. Do they ooze passion for community stories? Or do they just show up and do stuff on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Are they passionate about the community and their stories? Um, because I think the real opportunity for us as regional broadcasters is to unleash those stories, those great stories that are in our community. And the third piece, coming from Canada, couldn't possibly do a session without a reference to hockey. Um, but uh, Wayne Gretzky, some of you may know, but he used to say, skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it is. And I think that's the challenge of us as, as broadcasters, as public broadcasters now, is where is our community moving in the future, and are we skating towards where they're moving, or are we skating towards where they've been in the past? And this causes us to really think differently um, about everything that we do. Okay, so let's take these one by one. How do we better inspire, enlighten, and facilitate the community dreams around us? So the f here's, here's some statistics that, that I have collected. I've, I've, I, you know, I could do it for every country, but I, we don't have time. So here's an example. Um, the Spanish media industry last year, um, and you, you've got the results from uh, 08 and 09. You see how, how they had 3.1 billion euros uh, TV ad revenue in uh, 08 dropped to 2.3 billion, 30% uh, decrease. Newspapers going down, magazines going down, radios going down. What's happening? Online, online's going up. Online advertising has, has really, advertising in general has shifted into the online zone. Um, now, we also have uh, internet penetration. 54% of Spain is, is uh, uh, of the households have got internet. Only 20% of them are high speed though. Now this is important because as we think about uh, web TV or broadcasting over the web, one of our challenges of course is to make sure that our audience and our households actually have the capacity to handle web TV. And if you've only got 20% of your households on high speed uh, internet, that makes it tough to deliver to your audience. But you know, hopefully that's, getting, that's, that's moving forward. 23% um, per, uh, penetration of smartphones so that would be iPhones and Blackberries and things like that beyond regular cell phones. Now that's good, that's good. Number two in the world. And one in two so, uh, uh, being sold right now in Spain are smartphones. So this means that the platform for mobile is, is not only available now, but it's growing. So that's good to know. And um, right now Spain is considered probably the most advanced uh, in mobile advertising uh, in, in the world. Um, now, the next uh, piece of information here, just trying to build up some knowledge base and some, some data here, and then we'll make some conclusions uh, uh, towards the end. Now, uh, people say, well, what's happening with the viewers? Like, are people watching uh, the internet? Are they watching television? Well, here's uh, Microsoft's uh, EMEA report came out at the end of 2009, and basically what they're seeing on the, 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 perp the deep purple um, is the, uh, the internet growth. And the light purple is if um, is if that's a fairly slow growth, and uh, the purp the darker purple is assuming the current uh, s sorry uh, the dark purple is uh, uh, um, a slower growth, and the light purple is the current growth projected. Um, and then you'll see the television utilization. This is the hours per week of cr consumption, and what we're seeing is this year is the first time where the the lines cross. So the average consumption uh, per week of internet is uh, now starting to surpass that of television. Okay? Um, now, 
you guys probably have kids, uh, some of you, like, like my kids who are uh, late teens, early 20s. They spend all their time on the computer, and the television is over there. And they just kind of turn to the television when the stuff on their computer doesn't interest them. But in fact, they're getting the television programs through their computers. So there's a whole generation for which the, the regular television is a, a more minor part. But here's another interesting thing. Uh, in, in Europe, you've got 240 million users, 110% of the population have a cell phone, and over 30% in general have smartphones, according to Nielsen. Pretty close to the last statistic that we saw. Um, now, the, the last place embedded in the middle here uh, of Europe there is the uh, world internet util utilization. And you'll see there for Europe, we've got a 53% average penetration in internet. Now, of course, the, in the northern uh, part of uh, Europe, the penetration is actually higher than in the southern part of Europe. But that's, that's sort of average for all. So you've got a pretty good internet penetration compared to uh, the rest of the world, uh, other than North America. Canada right now, we have 80% of our households actually have uh, high-speed internet. And we're uh, fairly well uh, connected that way. Um, social networking. Um, for those of you who think it's only minor, here's some statistics again. Um, and uh, we are seeing now that of the uh, users of uh, mobile devices uh, and uh, people who are online, um, these are the statistics of uh, the percentage that are involved in social networking. So if you've got a computer or you've got a mobile device, are you involved in social networking? Well, the answer is clearly Yes, and Brazil has the most active at currently now, uh, uh, well, latest figures of December 08, of 80%. Um, but there you see Spain, 75%, Italy, 73%, uh, France is there at uh, 67%, Germany, 51%, so, um, and the UK, uh, sorry, I missed them, UK, 69%. So, uh, London is actually considered the Twitter capital of the world and the, and the social media center of the world. So um, in fact, the utilization in Europe is much higher than we're seeing in North America at the moment. So you guys are actually very much leading in the area of social networking. Um, OK, now as we start to, to um, work with some of that foundational information, the next thing we have to understand is that there's different, um, different models of business and different programming for, for the different slices. So there's radio, there's television, there's internet, there's mobile, obviously. But now we also have to layer onto that the different demographics. And this is really quite uh, you know, fascinating to me how, how often um, this doesn't seem to be well understood. So at the sake of maybe telling some of you what you already know, here's just a reminder, right? This is within a few percentage points, the same gen uh, generational breakdown, uh, no matter what country you live in. So we have the gray wave, that's the folks that are uh, right now, the median age for the gray wave is uh, about 73, let's say 75, round numbers. The uh, baby boomer generation, the median age for that is about 50, 51. The Gen Xers, uh, sorry, yeah, the Gen Xers, um, uh, the median age is 35. And the Echo generation or Generation Y, the median age is 21. And you'll see the percentage breakouts there. When we start talking about programming and, and when we tar start talking about who are we um, serving as public broadcasters, we have to recognize that we're not just serving the community, but there's at least four different breakdowns to that community um, that we always have to think about. And the reason is, I'll show you in just a moment, is that they think and use media completely differently. Okay. Um, just very quickly, some, demo, um, some demographic uh, charts. So here, just as an example, in, for, for Germany, you'll see how the, de the, uh, um, the demo is playing out. So this is uh, 2008 data, but you'll see that the big bars here, that's your, uh, that's your boomer generation, um, average age of you know, 45 to 49 there. And uh, so that's your biggest demographic group. You see another big demographic bulge up there in the over 75 crowd. And then as you move down into that under 
30 crowd, which we talk about in the commercial circles as being the crowd that everybody wants because that's their money group, but you'll see that actually demographically it's a smaller number of people um, as, it, as it pulls off. Uh, you can see Poland there has got definitely two bulges. Um, they've got actually a fairly youthful Gen, uh, Gen X group there as well as the baby boomer group. And we'll just uh, fill up the page with a few others. There's Spain, Czech Republic, and Italy. So you'll see very similar kinds of demographic patterns here are bulges in the, in the boomers and the, the gray wave, but then uh, the, underneath it in the youth group, it, it tends to dis decline a little bit. Compare that to some other countries and um, Turkey. New entrant, you know, recent entrant to the, um, to the EU. What does this tell us? This, this tells us that there's going to be amazing growth, right? This is, this is a country where it's got a youth group that's, that's growing in its capacity to, to be an economic engine and to, to, uh, to drive consumption and content demands. So there's, there, that's, you know, that's Turkey's demographics, and we can fill up the rest of the page. Uh, India, Indonesia, Brazil, uh, the United States is more squarish. So, but look at Turkey, India, Indonesia, Brazil. These are, these are economies where there's a great source of uh, new uh, and younger generation people coming. The other thing is these are potential export markets, right, for our programming and, and our, our, uh, our work. So we shouldn't underestimate that. Now, um, here's a picture of Germany and the, uh, pro the public broadcasters there. Uh, so uh, we see that the uh, public broadcasters in Germany have great market share over 60. They own the marketplace for the over 60 crowd. Any challenges you see there? They, they don't reach very well the people under 30, right? So one of the challenges, of course, this is a demographic that we see quite consistently in public broadcasting. Uh, BBC notwithstanding, maybe NRK notwithstanding, but um, this is a very common pattern in public and regional broadcasting. We seem to be very attractive and very well watched in the over 65 crowd, but down in the mainstream crowd, um, they are tuning in elsewhere. So that gives us a challenge, right, to face. Now, the other thing is that um, Europe as we know it, the countries as we know it, the boundaries are falling. Not only are you talking just EU-ish these days, but the boundaries are falling because there's, there, the signals are easily moving across boundaries, right? So it doesn't really matter whether I produce programming in Germany or Italy or France, they can get across into those other markets. And um, so uh, our consumers are shifting and changing and um, we are consuming different media than the best. Sorry, this is, uh, okay, just fill it up. Um, when we look at the gray wave, what do we know about the gray wave? Well, the gray wave has traditionally been the radio generation. My parents have got radios in every room of the house, right? And my father insists on taking a radio every time he travels. And if he's traveling to Europe, he knows he has to take a shortwave radio and because radio is really important. And what we also know about the gray wave is that they actually do prefer programming in their own language and with a, a focus on their own geographic uh, uh, areas. Um, baby boomers um, grew up with television, and so they're really the TV generation. But more than that, they also travel a lot. Our baby boomers are the main travelers in, in the world right now, and they consider themselves citizens of the world. Most of them are multilingual. And, and so what they're looking for, they, they go wherever the best is, as they determine the best. So they will source programming, they will source vacations, whatever, they will go wherever the best is. And if your programming is the best programming, they will find it. If it's not, they'll go somebody else who they believe has the best programming. These guys are what we call digital immigrants. 
they are new to the concept of mobile phones and things like that, so they're, they're not so techno-able. Um, you know, how many of you have the VCR that still has the lights flashing on it at zero, zero? Um, anyway, some of those, yeah, some of you are wondering what a VCR is, but anyway, um, okay. Those of us in the baby boomer crowd, we know that, we get that. Okay, Generation X is um, the internet generation. So, so they grew up with the internet. Um, doesn't matter what country they come from, they're comfortable in English. They travel widely, both uh, you know, with backpacks, but also digitally. And these are what we would call the digital natives. These are the guys who actually get Twitter and YouTube and, and know how to put a YouTube up video in five minutes, where it, was, it might take me five hours uh, to figure it out. But they, they get it, they use it, and they, and they know it. They're very comfortable. Um, and remember, uh, Generation X, the uh, median age is about 35. Generation Y, mediation, median age about 21. They grew up with social media. They're the ones who've actually been the ones who really have driven social media. They're the mobile generation. They get into chat speak for them you know, interactivity means can I talk about it with somebody that I know. For them, borders what borders. I mean, I, my daughter teaches, uh, uh, talks and chats to people in countries all around the world, and for her, there are no borders. Um, and it's really, it's, she defines her community based on her, her people in that community rather than where they live. Um, and uh, these are what we would call the eye brains, the internet brains. These guys just uh, think differently. They think in spurts. I mean, there's a whole pile of research. I don't know if you've seen the book uh, called Eye Brain. If you haven't, you should probably buy it and read it. But they, they, they're into social. They're into instant gratification. They're into short bursts of learning. If you try to talk to them for more than about 10 minutes about a particular topic, then they've had enough and they're on to the next. So um, when we look at all this, we now start to say, okay, so what's the future for TV going to be? Um, we've got nonlinear TV, we've got regular traditional TV, we've got mobile TV, we've got universal or on a, uh, alternative television. Um, which ones, where are we going with this? Well, let's have a look at what they are. So um, let's, let's create some avatars here. Our first avatar is Arthur. Um, he's a student, he's, so he's uh, one of those Gen Ys. He uh, looks at uh, portable uh, four-inch widescreen device. That's where he gets uh, his, his main uh, stuff, whether it's a, an iPod or a mobile television or whether it's a gaming device or whatever. Um, and his whole focus is download and go and take that with him on the, on the run or even get it real-time uh, downloaded through hotspots or internet or through the phone companies. Um, major social media, not so much TV consumption, less than, uh, less than an hour. What's interesting uh, to me uh, in talking to these guys, these guys actually are, uh, get their news from places like the Onion News Network. I don't know if you know Onion News, um, but Onion News is a satirical news channel. That's their primary source of news, is a satirical news channel. But they get the satire, which is really interesting because you think you'd, you, you'd need to know the facts in order to get the satire. So where are they getting their facts from? But anyway, um, uh, mobile television, greater than a couple hours, and lots of high-speed internet consumption. Okay, so that's Arthur, and um, we're gonna keep that avatar alive. Um, here's a different avatar, Vision 2, where we're kind of into the alternative media. And uh, we got Marcel here, a uh, dedicated surfer. What this person is doing is making his own content. This is the group that really is into creating their own content, sharing that own, their own content on YouTube and so on. Uh, they've got the high-powered, portable, multimedia computer gaming device. You know, in the future, that's probably going to have 240 gigs built into something about this big, uh, high-speed sp high mobile internet uh, altogether. Um, for television, is subscribing to the cheaper plans, and really the time in front of a TV is probably dedicated to stuff that he's 
already recorded and is watching when he wants to. And occasionally the big, the big event television, uh, like sports or concerts or 24 or something like that. Um, Vision 3, uh, the PVR fans uh, and the young boomers, Maria here. Now, first of all, when you're, whenever you're talking to a boomer, there's no such thing as an old boomer. They're all young boomers, right? We're all young boomers, no matter what our age. And, and the, there is a bit of a uh, tendency to focus on being young. Um, fixed and portable PVRs, they subscribe to cable and satellite. The time in uh, television, is, they want a HD. So these are the guys who are driving this whole HD uh, world. Um, Video on demand is becoming big for them, centered around the big drama, uh, things that get uh, sent all around the world. Um, and their high internet consumption is around search and news kind of things. This, these are our news groupies uh, as well. Okay, and then the last group are the, uh, the elder group, but they're of course more active than they ever have been. Uh, generally radio and television, these are the traditional viewers of uh, HD and real time. Um, again, uh, for these guys, news and local news is really very important to them. The internet use, if they're on the internet at all, is to talk to their grandchildren and uh, search for recipes and you know things like that. Also, some news focus. So, which of these four visions do you think uh, is going to win out into the future? The reality is, they're all going to be there. And so, as a regional broadcaster, you know, we have to think about, are we going to play in all four, or are we going to play in some of them? But this is a really important start to that reset of thinking, is to say, where do we want to play? You guys get to choose. Choose wisely, but you get to choose where do you want to play. Are you going to just play in traditional TV? If you're going to just play in traditional TV, which avatar are you building programmings for? Louise and Lou, right? Because, because Marcel's not coming to traditional TV, right? Not very often. So don't think you're, by creating a program for Marcel, that he's going to actually view it on traditional TV. If you want to get to, try, if you want to reach Marcel, you're going to have to be programming and delivering programming in the alternative television download and go kind of universe, which means you know you have to think differently now about how you develop your programming. This is a statistic from Europe. Fifteen percent of the people surveyed indicated that their primary screen for viewing media was their handheld device. 2009 statistic, 15%. 15% doesn't sound like a lot. 15% is a huge shift. And it's only going to grow. Expectations are that that's going to at least double in the next three years. 15% now, maybe 30% in the next three years. That's a third of the universe that is getting their primary screen for viewing uh, content is their mobile device. What is your mobile strategy? Now, here's a, we we're talking about the uh, different ways of making money and so on, but you know, MTV in Canada and the United States, but MTV last year, uh, sorry, at the end of 2008, uh, in Canada we hit the mark of 1 million downloads of music videos, and in the USA, same year, 10 million downloads. Now, they both have television channels. They don't make their money on their television channels. Their television channels drives people to the web to download content, and they make money when they download the content. Their strategy is not to make money off of the television thing, but to actually um, to make money off their other platforms. And they have, uh, they have all these uh, surfing uh, things going on uh, about behind the, the hills television and so on that is happening um, off the regular television channel. 
and that's where a lot of their con uh, that's where a lot of their audience is there. They're they're twittering, they're YouTubing, they're, they're out on these extended platforms for for working. Now, again, if you're trying to get into that audience, you're going to have to be thinking like an MTV thinks as far as working um, your programming. So this is some of the more discrete and definitive, uh, you know, specifics from, uh, from uh, what we were talking about this morning. Um, apps, okay, we all know about them. Huge, huge area, growing business. And the question, I guess, comes back to, you know, what, what uh, apps have you got? Mobile gaming. Okay, when, when you think about mobile gaming, what comes to mind? This kind of stuff, right? Or do you know Facebook mobile games like Mafia Wars and Farmville outpaced last year the big type of regular gaming? People are playing Facebook gaming on their mobile more so than any of this other gaming that's going on. It's, it's amazing to think of this now as mobile gaming. Of course, the iPhone brings a whole new kind of mobile gaming in that it's, it's part of the handheld uh, device itself. Um, so, back to public and community challenges. Uh, do you offer a mobile app for BlackBerry and, uh, and iTunes uh, or iPhones? Do you have games and interactive web elements for your, for your uh, community? Do you mediate the social um, interaction? Because as people are on Facebook, you can have Facebook and you can have YouTube and you can have Twitter through your channel, but you also have to mediate it. You have to have a way of bringing that content into your uh, channel content. And are you a place through which your community flows? Are you we were talking about being at the cross, crossroads. Are you a crossroad? This is not being at the crossroads. Are you the crossroad for your community for which they flow to get their knowledge and their information and their sharing? That's the opportunity for community television is to be the crossroads for your community. Okay, keep going. Um, are you important in the daily lives? That's, that's ultimately the question. Knowledge Television, BBC, these are great examples of, of organizations that have, have made this shift. The not so great examples of this, well, I'll leave that uh, to your uh, thinking. Our Canadian broadcaster, CBC, has, has, is crashing and burning right now. They've become largely irrelevant the program is second rate. People don't know what they're going to get on our national public broadcaster when they tune into it. Knowledge Network, on the other hand, a regional public broadcaster, we worked with them a couple of years ago, they redefined their presence as, as taking, you know, being the place where British Columbians connected to the world. They've doubled their market share. They've increased their sponsorship. So they they're working, right? It's working. It's a, a good success story. Doug, could okay. I just hold you there at yes. this stage? Um, I think, yeah, we will be going for lunch at five past one. So we're going to let things go for about 15 minutes. We've had, we've had, uh, I, we've had a lot of knowledge, a lot of information, a lot of facts and figures. I want, I want Doug to take a little breather, and I want to bring some rapid questions in. Sharp intakes of breath, and I'm willing to take three quick <laughs> questions. Starting here. A microphone there. We could get that mobile mic. One mobile mic, thank you kindly. In the best traditions of public service broadcasting, you ask for one, you get two. Hi, um, I'm Nathalie Nofenik from Water. Hey, could we turn on that mobile mic? Okay. Okay, I, I'm Nathalie Nofenik from Water. What you said is music to my ears. But um, I challenge you on one thing, because when you started, you said, it's not about investment, it's about ideas. 
To do this, you need money. And a lot of small stations don't have it. Yeah, this is a big okay, conundrum. Don't right? answer yet, Doug, because there's yeah. going to be more coming where that came from. Okay. Okay, second question coming in. You're going to have. Is yes. there a woman at the back there? Yes, down on the left. And please be framing your questions in your mind because I can hear you thinking. <laughs> um, uh, Deirdre Kevin from the European Audiovisual Observatory. Um, I very much liked your presentation. I'd, I'd like to know who's, what sort of a student grant Arthur has, how, how he can afford all those gadgets, because that is <laughs> quite fascinating. Um, no, my point was just briefly that I guess it's, it's for broadcasters, it's more important delivery, because at the end of the day, Marcel and Arthur and all these people are going to grow up. You know, they're not going to be kids forever, and they're also going to want news and information and all those things that... Uh, the German public service and all those broadcasters uh, provide for the over 60s. So people can't lose that, that view of um, providing content. But you don't want me to talk to Not yet, I'm okay. just going to, thank you, I'm going to take a, yes. Hi, Miklos, I also would like to challenge you on the money question a little bit, because it's not just about whether you have money or not, but where are you having it from, because the reason for all those reforms that were discussed in the previous session is that commercial revenue mostly produces commercial programming and not public service uh, programming. So the revenue that is needed for this wonderful new world of mobile television and reaching those generations needs to be not commercial, one of those reform revenues. So that's a very important aspect I believe you should re react okay, to. Okay, I'm going to come back to Doug. Essentially, Doug, they don't believe you. They say, great stuff, but <laughs> if, you don't, exactly have, if you don't have the money, if you don't have the money, you can't do it. Right. And anyway, kids are going to grow up. Don't, don't get hung up on them. Go for it. Okay, well, um, maybe we'll just advance to the next slide, actually, because, okay, it's, it's, it's not about the money, but it is about the money, okay? And... and the reality is that, that um, the challenge, though, is if we just look for the money, we're not thinking about our programming. If we're, if we're just chasing funding, then we end up doing the programming that the funders are willing to fund for. Flip it around. Get out there and be the great community channel. channel. And funding will follow you. Update your programming, update your delivery, update all that stuff, be the crossroad. And then the funding will follow. When I got to BAMF, 70% funding cut. I could have sat there and chased funding or said we'll make cutbacks and everything else. We didn't. We got about making the best programming for the people we are serving. And as soon as we started delivering on that, the funding came from all kinds of un, uh, un, uh, you know, predicted sources. So seriously, like, get out and, and, and engage the new programming. Now, I think there are some ways of doing this in less costly ways. Let's, uh, my technology guy here, let's uh, keep, keep going, keep going. OK, this is critical. This is absolutely critical. And I love this picture, by the way. But um, do your people have a passion for community stories? And how do we bring that passion for community stories to our community channels? We have some great stories out there. We have to find a way to unleash them. Now, there's a couple of uh, ways of, of doing this, too, that doesn't necessarily cost money. See, here's the thing. What is quality story? What's a quality story? It depends on those, on those groups. For the over 65 group who wants it in HD with high broadcast quality, they think about that. For Marcel's of the world, for the Gen Xers of the world, Gen Y's of the world, they don't care about HD or whatever. They want fascinating stories. They want engagement, right? Um, so here's some things that are really important for you to do. What we're finding in some really great success stories of regional television, whether they're private 
regional television or public regional television is this concept of embedded reporters. Um, K-Ron from, uh, from uh, San Francisco, KnowledgeNet now uh, in, in BC. Um, I was in Catalonia uh, in the fall and they've been starting to do some of that there. Embedded reporters get, get the people into the community, right? Now, um, also get the independent producers going and uh, get, this, get this embracement of social media. Community engagement is critical. How do we engage community? Engaging community it will be different for different age groups again. Maybe for the Gen Ys, engaging community is giving them the Friday night party spot on your channel. And they program it for their own people. That would challenge us because we're putting control or we don't have control over that. But if we're really serious about getting the youth into our system, we would give them that Friday night, 8 o'clock time spot, you build the programming f for your own colleagues. It's the party channel on 8 o'clock Friday night. I don't know. But I think we got to think about things differently, right? Roving reporters get out there and interview and find those great stories and bring them to the table. So different demos, different engagement, right? And um, those, the, the concept of embedded reporters, you could be partnering with community colleges. You could be partnering with, uh, I don't know, youth groups. They don't all have, the, the money doesn't all have to come from you, right? So as you create these partnerships with these other agencies, all of a sudden you tap into different funds and you can get them, you can get all kinds of new programming ideas going with, with that. Okay, Doug, gonna stop you there again. Um, thoughts, questions, pie in the sky or reality? Does it mean anything to any of us? Does it answer questions? Does it pose questions? Anybody using embedded reporters right now? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. How's it working? Show Makathihi. Perfect. Yeah? Yeah. In a community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, uh, there's a, group, a couple groups that I'm working with right now that are putting teenagers or, you know, first, second year college or university students in as embedded reporters. They find great stories. They bring them, bring them in. It's great, you know. It's like the community is talking to each other, right, which puts you at the crossroads. The great story that the late Peter Zauer used to tell, something that he had started within his own station, was the idea of the club. Very simple approach where they invited people to send photographs on their mobile phones, uh, do it on the time of the year, the autumnal photographs, summer pho uh, photographs. They, they would show them at the end of the newscast. They started to build up a following. They also got the names of the people sending in the, the photographs. Uh, phone absolutely. number, contests, all then, kinds of things. And then when events started to happen, and there was a major uh, uh, event a year ago, they, were on t they, were, they got the first photographs from the area from people who were part of this club because they had their phone numbers, phoned them. Now you have pictures for your website, and you have a voice to go on radio, and you have someone to do a TV interview as well. Um, this is the production studio of the future, particularly for regional broadcasters. Knowledge Network last year closed down their studios. They put it all onto mobile platform. So now even their news is shot with a handheld HD camera connected to a editing system on your laptop linked back to the mixing studio by the uh, by the wireless uh, device. And uh, City Television, which is fairly well known in Toronto but has, has uh, replicated their format around the world, uses what they call VJs, video jocks. You know DJs for those of us in the boomer crowd? It's now VJs. And so they're basically single or double teams, embedded reporters out there using this they get a few minutes to tinker with, uh, with the mix on the computer, then they're uploading real time to the, to the studio, and then it goes online. 
So this, I think, is, is what we, you, so you start talking about costs and so on. The costs of your studios go down dramatically when you're using this kind of technology, but the quality is quite good. And again, what is quality? If it's about community engagement, we measure quality completely differently. Um, also, you know, uh, we can be doing a lot by stimulating and investing in our independent production uh, people and uh, getting that community being creative and bringing those stories and, and so on to the table. The only Doug, thing take provides... A sharp, though, take, take another sharp yeah, intake of breath. Can I just make this last point? When, okay. when you go, when you, well, no, I'm just, it's connected. When you go to the, the, the thing about going and working with your independent producers, and if there's independent producers in the crowd, when you go to independent producers and you're talking about community television, we have to remember that it's, we want them to get stories about the community, not their stories. Not the stories that they've been trying to build and get on a platform for the last 10 years of their life. You know, we need them to get the community stories, not their stories. Okay. What, what I was going to say was that, that we, we have attempted, we are attempting to follow a lot of this in my own station, and it is a slow process, but our, our re initial responses are very, very positive, where we have an embedded reporter in an area. We don't have any staff camera crews. We have a lot of our camera people here. They're all freelance. They're all independent producers. It's, it's, it's that kind of approach. Uh, it, it, what Doug is talking about is very much linked to reality. I'd like to go for two questions. I'm going to come back to Doug then, and I'm going to wrap it in the front. I'll be taking one more question after this. Uh, I think uh, uh, at our station in SVT in Sweden, uh, quality is so much linked to infrastructure. And how do you, with this uh, argumentation, meet that quality debate? Oh, this, this is a, a great question, right? And, and the, you know, how you answer that question will be different depending on the demo, right? So a gray wave person will answer the question of quality around production value, storyline, um, good scenery, and, and so on. A Gen Y person will answer that whole question about quality as to whether or not I get a chance to interface and interact with other people my age. They don't care if the camera jumps around a little bit. They don't actually care about storyline. They, they want interface and interaction. And for them, quality is completely differently defined than the gray wave. And this is, this is the real challenge around this quality debate, is nobody says, well, wait a second, which, uh, which viewer audience element are we talking about? Right? Because if, if, if you're ARD and ZDF and so on, and, and, you wanna, and you're happy with market share mainly coming from your over 65s, then that's how you define it. But there's a lot of other people paying taxes under the age of 65 that probably deserve some programming. Now, how do they define quality? It will be different. Thank you, Doug. One more question. This, uh, okay. Gellar. Certainly. Yeah, second row. Yeah, this lady here. Yeah. But we have, uh, as a public broadcaster, um, a mission to uh, reach all the Flemish people. VRT has to reach all the Flemish people. Mm -hmm. So the grey wave, the young ones, everyone. So how can we do that? Because a quality standard, that's one quality standard. Can we have different quality but standards? But that's an assumption, right? An assumption of one quality standard. No, I just yeah. asked the question, how can we Absolutely. do that? Reach everybody. Yeah, so that's, it all. That's, how, that's why you have timetables, right? So Friday night is the uh, party night for the uh, you know, 18 to 25 year olds. Thursday night is, uh, I don't know, high quality social interaction uh, night for the over 65s. Wednesday night is a meaningful expose on the values in your society and, and how they're being lived out or challenged, uh, tuned in with some some experts in the community for your, for your boomer crowd, right? 
and, and what defines quality on Wednesday night may be very different than what defines quality on Friday night. Many... This is shaking it up, I know, right? This is pushing, pushing the envelope a little bit. But again, you've got to find that relevancy, right? Many, many years ago, um, I worked with an editor who was absolutely crap when it came to editorial judgment, but he had a great legal mind. And when people challenged him on balance, that program was unbalanced. He would say balance was never decided on one program. It could be decided on the basis of the night, the week, or to hell. It can be decided on what we put out over the last 12 months. Legally, uh, and I'm sure Jacques Brickman would have an opinion legally on this, but that stands up as an a not just an answer, but an approach. I, I know there's lots of things. Doug is going to be staying with us. Uh, you're going to have an opportunity to, to, to meet and, and greet and challenge. First thing I want to do on your behalf is to thank Doug, because I, again, found that inspiring. Okay. Thank you. I also some of, here's just some of the uh, questions coming out here on okay. Twitter, so uh, for those of you who are following, the beauty of social networks is the low budget, right? And it's about ideas. Ideas don't have a price tag, right? That's the key thing that I learned over, over my career. Put some people together. Have you ever thought about getting, uh, say, 15, 20-year-olds in a room and having them dream up the programming strategy for, for them? I mean, why not? I bet you they would come up with some amazing ideas for programming. And you might even find that it doesn't have to be on your television channel. It may be that they're going to get it off the web, right? And so your channeling reach comes for different platforms, too. In, in the afternoon, we will be coming back to some of this theme when we approach the question of which funding. It's what about the ideas that come for cheap, but the cost if you don't have the money, how do you do it? We're going to try and address that in the afternoon. I just want to make one little commercial announcement at this stage, two actually. We are going to be back here at 2.15. That's the first thing. Second thing is the ideas bazaar tomorrow. Johan Linden will be acting as ringmaster for the ideas bazaar. Two of my colleagues from Ireland who might stand up and identify themselves, Ivor, and Dave, now, the, anyone who has sent us information on the Ideas Bazaar, who have presentations, may contact with Ivor and Dave immediately after this session. One of the ideas that Ivor and Dave themselves will be outlining tomorrow is how, within CIRCOM, low cost, we can set up a regional news exchange program based on an experiment we're doing with BBC Scotland at the moment. That's one of the ideas for tomorrow's Ideas Bazaar. And don't forget Mozart, the one-man band, the one-man all-singing, all-dancing studio is on, going out here at the moment as we speak. Definitely do a visit. There's our schedule. Guys, enjoy the next 60 minutes. Find out who, you, who you'd like to sit with, don't decide on the basis of personality. Decide on the basis of how can you use this person most. Thanks again, Doug. See you all, 2.15.